Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Aya Schumann. I'm a member of the FDA stakeholder engagement team within the Office of External Affairs. As you just heard, this call is being recorded. Today, we're joined by Dr. Janet Woodcock, Acting FDA Commissioner, and Dr. Peter Marks, Director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Both of our FDA principals will provide opening remarks before we move into a question and answer session. And I'd like to now direct you to the bottom of your screen to ask a question during today's session, please raise your hand via the participant tab, or you can also enter your question into the chat box if you prefer to not be called on live. Please remember to state your name and affiliation so that we know which organization you represent. And we will begin the call very shortly. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Please take a moment to double check that you are muted and that your video is off, um, unless you wish to turn it back on if you're called to speak during the Q&A portion of the call. And with that, I'd like to now turn the call over to Acting FDA Commissioner, Dr. Janet Woodcock. Thanks very much, Aya. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. And first of all, I'd like to start with an apology. You know, normally we've tried to be very transparent and get information to you all as quickly as possible, particularly about adverse events. But as you probably know, there was a leak to the media and we had to scramble to get information out before we could really have pretty uh, simultaneous calls scheduled with the important people to get the word out. So that's how this one happened. We're going to try to take steps to keep that from happening again. But um, there you go. So we did pull this call together to discuss the preliminary reports of Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, following Anson vaccination, and also to have a Q&A back and forth about this. As you undoubtedly know with your experience, uh, a GBS is a neurologic syndrome. It's been observed at an increased rate with uh, generally with a few vaccines, certain seasonal flu vaccines and so forth, but generally speaking, it follows uh, infection with a virus or bacteria or some other sort of immunologic challenge. Um, but it can actually be uh, associated with vaccination as another kind of immunologic challenge. The FDA has revised the vaccine recipient and provider fact sheets for the Janssen vaccine to include information on a suggested increased risk of GBS with the vaccination. As of June 30th, uh, 2021, we had 100 reports of GBS, uh, 95 of them serious, including one potentially related death that were identified uh, in the uh, VAR system within 42 days following vaccination with the vaccine. <clears throat> and we had about 12.2 million doses administered. And although the available evidence really suggests an association, it's insufficient at this point to establish a causal relationship. As with any medicine, uh, risk will be detected, frankly, once a, a product is administered broadly, particularly a vaccine, uh, we'll see rare events that were not seen in clinical trials. We know it's important that we're transparent and provide information about these risks once they're identified. But of course, we rely on folks like you to put these in the overall context of the risks and benefits of getting the vaccine. Um, we've evaluated this available, this additional information for the Janssen vaccine along with the CDC, and we continue to find the benefits outweigh the known and potential risks. And we continue to work to protect the health and safety of all Americans at the FDA, we're really committed to making decisions that are guided by science and that people can trust. So I'm looking forward to the discussion and to answering your questions. And again, sorry about not having a very timely notification. And now I'd like to pass the call over to my colleague, Dr. Peter Marks, who's director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Peter. Yeah, so th thanks again for joining today. And I'd also just echo that um, we will try to have better lines of communication in, in the future. Um, just, uh, I just want to just add that just to put this uh, potential risk in perspective of um, other safety signals that we've seen with this particular vaccine. You know, you might have heard about this thrombosis, thrombocytopenia syndrome um, with the Janssen vaccine. Um, the increased risk of 
uh, of, of Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, it, it would appear, the association appears to be about that same size uh, in terms of um, a, uh, a few cases uh, per uh, million uh, uh, doses administered. And so um, again, the, by putting this all together, um, uh, these, these are all rare risks. So taken overall, when we think about this, the potential benefits of this vaccine still far outweigh the risks in the overall population of individuals. And the CDC had some very nice slides of that uh, for um, uh, the thrombosis thrombocytopenia syndrome. And you could see from looking at those that even if you doubled the number of cases of thrombosis thrombocytopenia syndrome, you still had a very favorable uh, benefit risk profile. And here, I think what, what we're saying is, yes, this is a possible uh, associated uh, signal with, with this vaccine, but again, it doesn't change the overall uh, risk uh, consideration. So I'll stop there. And I think we look forward to, to trying to take questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Marks. As we enter into the question and, and answer segment of our event, I'd like to first call on Abby Bonus from Adult Vaccine Access Coalition for some brief opening comments and our first questions. Hi, thanks so much. Um, hi, Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Hi. Marks and the whole FDA team. Thank you so much for coordinating this stakeholder call. Um, as I said, I'm Abby Bonus and I manage the Adult Vaccine Access Coalition. Uh, which consists of over 60 organizations that work to improve access and utilization uh, to adult vaccines, including the COVID-19 vaccine. Members of our coalition have been working since you know, the launch of the COVID-19 vaccine uh, to ensure equitable access and provide educational opportunities to help instill confidence in the vaccines. As FDA continues to recognize that the known and potential benefits clearly outweigh the known and potential risks for um, the Janssen vaccine, how can we as immunization advocates help convey this information to the public? Thank you. Well, uh, this is Janet. I think we, we, are, we need to rely upon you. There's tremendous distrust of authority. So I think the grassroots um, um, dissemination of information is really important, trusted leaders, uh, thought leaders in the community of different kinds um, or prominent individuals who are willing to get behind this because we are getting kind of up against the wall on vaccination and the rate is slowing down and so forth. We have a huge number of vulnerable people with the uh, Delta variant uh, rising. Um, so we're in a critical situation again and yet we have a large number of people um, who don't wanna get vaccinated. And in fact, we recognize that talking about these adverse events, they're very scary and announcing them and everything is, doesn't help. But on the other hand, not being open and transparent would be worse. <laughs> so I think, you know, we need to rely, we need to all work together and re, um, I think rely on uh, local influencers and everything as much as possible to try to get people vaccinated because they are really at risk again now. Peter? Sorry, yeah, I, thanks very much. I, I would just add that, you know, from what I can see that one of the things that you can do to help in, is probably help find a network in your area of providers who are very patient. Because my <laughs> finding is that, um, and I've, 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 the people who have, I've helped to get vaccinated who were hesitant, some of them required you know, much longer than the average provider wants to spend um, discussing vaccines. And I think it, it will require some patience, but if it gets someone to, um, and, and sometimes it turns out that people have very specific concerns that they're not comfortable saying until after they've had several back and forth. I can tell you one that I'm willing to share um, was, you know, it was back and forth, back and forth. Well, oh, what about this? And what about that? And oh, but it wouldn't be better if it's licensed. And the end of the day, it was because, well, they had heard a rumor that it reduced uh, male sexual potency. That's that, you know, that was an, it, it, it's kind of an internet garbage that right. you can just say that's, that's just not the case. Now it is true. I think one has to be honest. It is true that if you get kind of the fatigue 
uh, and, uh, and for the first day or two after you get the vaccine, it is possible uh, that you may feel uh, somewhat off in general. Um, and uh, I'm not going to deny that, uh, but um, there are all sorts of things. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the rumors about changing genetic material, affecting your unborn child, those things really scare people. And often they're, they know that they may not be true. The hard things is the one things that they, don't, they, they, that they know may not be true, but yet they're afraid to ask. And so they lurk and they prevent people from getting there. So long way of saying that we need a really good group of patient immunization providers to answer questions and hopefully get people to yes. That's so helpful. And I think it leads into a follow-up if you don't mind me asking one more, because I, I think you've all put out some really great information, both FDA and CDC for recipients and caregivers that really note the symptoms that people should watch out for. And so obviously it's important to raise awareness around the signs and signals of any adverse event. Um, and how are you working to ensure that the providers in, in the full immunization neighborhood, right? So doctors and nurses and pharmacists and others have that up-to-date information as it becomes available. So I can, I mean, what we do is every time that we uh, change, like for instance, the uh, information on Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, as we updated the provider information and the patient information, we also push out um, a, uh, an email goes out um, uh, uh, to uh, providers. Um, uh, uh, so um, I think we've tried to make sure we've been very transparent about what we've been doing in terms of having, you know, when we, when we do these things, we, uh, we uh, either have press releases or uh, some other way of making the announcement so it's clear um, uh, CDC has also done this by uh, updating their website. We update our websites. Um, uh, and uh, we also go about doing provider education, whether it be on the American Medical Association, I've done a number of those, or um, uh, the Hospital Pharmacists Association. And we do those pretty regularly to keep people up to date uh, on uh, the list of um, adverse events that might be presence. So we'll continue to try to do that uh, because I agree with you, the more people are educated about these, the more they can answer questions appropriately. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Abby, for being with us today. I'd like to now turn to Lisa Butler, Executive Director of GBS CIDP for additional questions. Thanks so much. Um, thank you to the FDA and team for hosting us today. I um, much appreciate the opportunity. So I have a couple of questions. Um, you know, the GBS community is traditionally vaccine hesitant, but is there any information um, being collected around people that had GBS in the past and then had uncomplicated vaccinations? And then is that data being used for guidance here so essentially, should people um, who had GBS in the past, you know, should they receive the J&J &J vaccine or should they look elsewhere? Yeah, I, I'll try to take a stab at that one, Janet. I mean, we don't have the data that you're asking for yet. Uh, we probably will at some point, but it's not there yet. And so I think it is one of these questions uh, that I think if someone's had GBS, they need to talk to their provider because mm -hmm. I, I can imagine uh, that there could be a, you know, it, depending on the level of concern that someone might have, um, a provider might suggest an alternative. I, again, I, I, we just don't have the data yet. Okay, thank you. Um, and is the FDA working with other countries um, to collect more data on this as well? And would that apply to not just the J&J &J vaccine? I think perhaps a similar message was out with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so uh, yeah, we're, we're working very actively. In fact, I was on the phone with <laughs> colleagues from Europe. Uh, they're, they're obviously, you can, you can their pr process is transparent as well. They're obviously, um, uh, their, their vaccine uh, safety committee equivalent um, is looking at this and they'll be having meetings over the next week or two uh, because yes, for them, it's not just the Janssen vaccine, it's also the AstraZeneca vaccine, which seems to have a very similar a safety signal. It does seem like it's it's quite interesting. They both have the same 
uh, about the same signal for this, this thrombosis, thrombocytopenia syndrome. And it seems like this association um, with GBS is there for both of them as well. So it's probably the adenoviral platform um, that might be um, leading to that. So we, we'll continue to uh, work with them. And it's not, it turns out it's not just uh, the Europeans. We also have been uh, getting information from our Canadian colleagues to the north. Um, the Australians have been collecting data. Um, uh, in this particular case, um, the best data probably though will come from Europe and, uh, uh, and uh, our, our Northern neighbors because uh, certain places have not really deployed the Janssen vaccine uh, very significantly. Right. So could there be a revised sort of global statement then? At some point, at some point. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa. And before, before we turn to the chat box, I'd like to call on Jennifer Zavalinsky, Director of Public Health Education and Communication at Vaccinate Your Family for some questions. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you to FDA for having this call for or webinar for stakeholders. Really appreciate it. Um, my question is related to the GBS cases themselves. Um, I was wondering if there was anything about the people who ended up having cases of GBS after vaccination, whether or not they had some kind of underlying condition or if they were mostly male or female or the ages were something specific, something that we might be able to share with the public? Um, sure, there were, it was more males than females in this case. I think it was about 60, 40 or 65, 35, if I recall exactly. And isn't that uh, kind of typical, Peter? Yes, yes. Um, and, and uh, there was no clear, there was no clear history that, that would have led you to think this might happen. Uh, the cases were pretty, um, the, the only uh, thing that wasn't typical for GBS about these was some of them presented with um, bilateral, um, bilateral Bell's palsy, you know, essentially bilateral facial paralysis, where, which is a little unusual. Um, uh, but since the data are from VAERS are not the most perfect, the data from the, we'll have to confirm some of this, but by and large, there wasn't any, there wasn't any way to predict, there wasn't anything that we could predict from histories here. Okay. Um, and then my other question is, if you're aware whether or not the ACIP, who's now going to be having a meeting next week, I believe they're going to be discussing these cases. And I was wondering if you know if they're going to be making any separate kind of decision or are they going to make some other kind of recommendation or a vote for everyone 18 years and older? Or is everything sticking with just the changes to the um, fact sheets from the FDA? Yeah, I, I can only, I, I can't say definitively because it's, it's the ACIP and we're the FDA, but my understanding is they're going to discuss these, but I don't believe they intend to take any action on these um, because I think that the, the signal has been reasonably well discussed. Um, and I, I don't think we expect like many changes to occur. I think we, we feel comfortable that we, we see this rate. We now have to confirm it. Um, uh, we're not, unlike the thrombosis thrombocytopenia syndrome, where when we first saw it, we didn't know whether we were missing some really big signal here mm -hmm. or something. Here, I think we, we see this as a signal. We think that we just have to refine it further, um, but we don't think we're missing a lot of cases that are, uh, that are not being recognized. Okay, I just have one other fast question. Um, it's mentioned on your site that there's 3,000 to 4,000 cases of GBS each year. And I was wondering if those people have any particular conditions, like is anything different about those cases of GBS? Were they caused by the flu and shingles vaccines or do you know what they're caused by? I, I can't tell you what the breakdown is, but you actually, you obviously are exactly right. There are some associations with you know, sometimes it's not every season's flu vaccine. Some seasons we have a flu vaccine that has a slightly higher rate of GBS. And it's true that the shingles vaccine um, uh, seems to be associated with a, a somewhat higher, you know, a, a, a slightly higher uh, incidence of uh, GBS than, than uh, you would expect. So, but I, I don't know that I can break down the, give you a breakdown there. From yeah, I mean, most of these are, um, 
what you know spontaneous, spontaneous you don't see a yeah. vaccine before them okay. they've had a virus exactly usually right. or maybe a bacterial infection or some other kind of exposure what it is is a person a vulnerable immune system uh, that encounters an antigen that probably causes cross reactivity with their part of their nervous system okay. right and so it's a, a, a concatenation of of, of factors and we don't know why it's older, more older people and more males, but that's just how it usually is. <laughs> yeah, but most of them are not caused by vaccination. That's great. That's what I was trying to also figure out. Okay, I'm sorry, you. that's, I, that's <laughs> I, I'm, I wasn't trying to be, I, I was just trying to tell you that they're, they're, that's, that's right. So these, most of these are not caused by vaccination. There, there's a small portion um, and uh, yeah, sorry. No, that's okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. We have a comment in the chat box about the need for funding of organizations that have relationships, existing relationships with minority populations. So I can actually ask an additional question that we've received recently. The J&J &J vaccine was in part distributed among at-risk populations. What would you say to various at-risk populations who were hesitant to get the vaccine before, who may be even more so hesitant now? You know, I think I think one of the things that's really important to realize is that um, COVID-19 is a much worse disease than any of these rare risk factors here. Right. And I and I, although it's always hard as a healthy individual to get uh, to contemplate taking something that could have a side effect, the problem is COVID-19 is very real. And it's unfortunately very much still with us. Yeah. Um, it is making a comeback here. And so if you're not vaccinated, particularly if you're in a community where there's low vaccination rates, um, it's a good idea to get vaccinated. And the, the, the risks of these, what are rare side effects, um, uh, are, are th those risks are greatly outweighed uh, by the potential benefits of getting vaccinated. And I think the right, the right answer there too, is if you have concerns, talk to your doctor. If you're it may be that certain people, if you've had a history of GBS, maybe you want to talk to your doctor. You might not be as comfortable with a vaccine uh, that has a history of this. Fine, there is an alternative. Um, some people, it's uh, it's the reverse. They're concerned about the risk of, of myocarditis with uh, the mRNA vaccines. Well, we have <laughs> the uh, single dose uh, Janssen vaccine. Uh, so there are the J&J &J vaccine. So I think it's really a matter of sometimes talking with your provider, but in general, the answer is, is generally that getting vaccinated, um, even for younger individuals, uh, is, uh, is a smart thing. I mean, they, it, I can only tell you some, from some emerging data that's coming from the South now that comes out of Missouri and Arkansas, that they are now seeing younger individuals getting COVID-19 and they're seeing some more severe cases than they were used to in the last round, probably uh, having to do with the Delta variant, uh, perhaps also because of, of who the virus has to get transmitted to. And so getting vaccinated is just a really good idea. And uh, you know, it, it, it's the, 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 the small risk um, is uh, from, from, from these side effects greatly outweighed by the benefits of not getting COVID-19. And, 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 and it's almost for anyone who's gotten long COVID-19, uh, the symptoms of either brain fog or some of the respiratory or heart problems, they'll tell you that since about one in five people get those who get uh, moderate to severe COVID-19, that's another thing you want to avoid. Long answer, sorry. Nope. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have another question from Chelsea from GBS CIDP. Um, Chelsea or Lisa, would you like to read your question live? Thank you so much. Um, and again, thanks for bringing this together. The foundation was also kind of curious to know what steps are being taken to confirm the diagnoses of the 100 cases of GBS um, and making sure that none of those are duplicated. We all know uh, GBS can be a 
a tricky one to diagnose. So just wanted to see what the process was like on your end. That's a really great question. So our folks use a diagnostic criteria. This is something that because we have a fair amount of experience, we do this every year for influenza vaccine and we do it for other vaccines. So they, they are, our epidemiologists are pretty experienced at, at looking at vaccine related GBS. So they have very strict diagnostic criteria and they go through the cases and you're right, sometimes there are duplicates because two different providers. So they try to make sure they have unique cases um, uh, and they meet, must meet the diagnostic criteria. Um, uh, and in some cases, you know, we, we do have cases that are kind of in a provisional pile until we get more, uh, uh, until we get more information um, uh, about them. Uh, so what we're talking about now is the ones that we feel comfortable with. Now, there's not the good news is this includes what we've got to date uh, because they caught up um, mm -hmm. uh, up through up through uh, the, the, up through June 30th. Um, uh, so um, your point very well taken, and it's why this has to be done carefully um, with uh, criteria. So these the, the criteria these are these Brighton uh, these Brighton criteria um, that are published. Okay, if I, if I can ask a follow-up to that, um, is time the only association between vaccination and GBS or how are you linking those events and excluding say like Campylobacter or something? Yeah, so that, that, that is one of the weaknesses. It's, no, you've got great questions. Uh, the, because of the way this has to be done in this setting, um, we, we simply do uh, what we know from uh, for previous vaccines, that there's this 42-day window. A after, after 42 days, it's very unlikely. And within four, even, even, and with the first, within the first 21 days, it's more, you know, it, if it's too soon after, it's unlikely. So this seven to 21-day window is probably the sweet spot. But um, because we want to make sure we're not missing things, we extend it to 42 uh, days. And you're right, we could be catching some otherwise idiopathic cases or cases caused by other, other infectious agents. But the way we look at that is, is in terms of risk, we're better off. I mean, the way I, I would say it is we're better off being a little bit more, uh, I would say conservative, telling people there might be a slightly higher risk and, and including those cases than, than excluding them. Obviously, we want to be as accurate as possible. But within the limitations of what we can do um, with the way these um, reports come in through VAERS, the, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Yeah, and I looked, this is Janet Woodcock, I looked at the spread and it was pretty tight around 14 days. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, there were some that were, that were fairly uh, more remote within the 42 days, but most of them were right about when you would expect with a reaction. Absolutely. So it is, I don't mean to take up all the time, this will be my okay. end, but it is possible that as we learn more that this situation might evolve in determining, you know, the strength or weakness of that association. Is that a fair assessment? That, that's absolutely mm -hmm. correct, because we'll be able to, we'll be able to do more studies. And especially after we are able to use some of the larger data, and this came from the VARES adverse event reporting system. When we're able to use the large national databases to query this, uh, it will be it will actually allow us to hone down more. Like for instance, we do that. Um, uh, that that's how the work was done for the shingles vaccine was using the Sentinel system, the large that you know it covers millions of lives, gets you to a much more accurate estimation than the way we're doing it right now. Got it. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you so much, Chelsea. We have another question from Abby Bonus from Adult Vaccine Access Coalition. Abby? Sure, thanks so much. Um, so just following up on that discussion where you raised the VAERS system. So I think we all know that vaccines are a safe and effective form of prevention, but we also have this strong safety system where people can report adverse events um, utilizing the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System or, or VAERS. So what are you all doing to make sure that the general public knows about the systems that are in place already around safety um, along with CDC? And again, how can we help talk about this system that people have the ability to report into? Yeah, and, and another really good question. Um, the, the patient information sheets have 
the information, the links for uh, VARES. We encourage providers to report to VARES. We encourage patients to report to VARES. Um, the vSafe system uh, from uh, CDC, that, that opt-in system was developed so that it also could dump to VARES. Um, but we would, uh, we, when I give talks, and I think we try, I, think, I know the CDC, when I've heard them give talks, uh, we all will encourage people to, they can report, you, you can report as a patient, you can report for a family member, uh, your provider can report. We're very happy to have anyone who um, feels uh, uh, that they have something that they want to report that's related to a safety event with the vaccine to report that. So I would just continue to spread the word that people should feel very free to report uh, to the system uh, and the web links are, are given. And, and for that matter, we can even, we can, we, we still, ha we still have left open the paper submission via fax so that mm -hmm. people uh, can still, you know, if they're not uh, tech savvy can even use um, paper still. But, and also we co-run this system with the with CDC, CDC and they have an enormous comm shop. And so they do a lot of outreach. They're more the outreach side of the house actually than FDA because we have so many other duties and so forth, but they do have a very big uh, communication function and outreach function. Thank you. Well, we appreciate the partnership on, on both sides there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, we have another question from Jennifer from Vaccinate Your Family. Jennifer, would you like to ask your question live? Sure. Um, I was just wondering if there was any more that could be told about the one person who died from GBS and whether or not we expect the remaining 99 people to recover fully, or I mean, obviously adding that information in to the public to let them know that most people recover fully is definitely something to help make them feel better about getting this vaccine. Yeah, so I, I can, I can uh, since CDC was on a, a public call yesterday and said some of these things, I will tell you what they said, which, uh, um, so we don't know about all of the hundred people, but many of the people have already recovered um, or are on their way to recovering. Obviously, I can't say about every last person yet, um, the one person who died is somebody who had several medical comorbidities at the same time. It was a complicated situation where they had had um, a heart attack um, and some other events around the time. So uh, although they presented also with signs that ultimately were felt to be GBS, it was very complicated to know what the actual cause of death was. But we, we, we've been it because, again, being conservative, it's it's. Uh, it's binned in here uh, because it's a possibility, um, but there were a number of other things going on in that particular individual. Okay. Yeah, and I would just, we, we don't want to mislead people. I know the GBS Foundation is on. Uh, not everyone fully recovers. Yeah. People may have right. sequelae from, from GBS, uh, but in general, they live, they survive the, uh, the, and many people fully recover, uh, but it, it isn't, uh, it is a serious uh, side effect to have, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Excellent, we have a question in the chat box from Venus. Venus, would you like to ask your question live? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Well, we have a, a telehealth community navigation call center manned by promotoras and community health workers. And we've been getting a lot of complaints because somehow the news comes out in, in real time by the New York Times and Washington Post. And then we have to later on, two days later, hear from the federal, federal government. We need this information right away from the federal government so we know how to answer our community, and it's been very frustrating for us. We are constantly trying to find information as soon as we hear from, from our community, uh, and, and we can't go to some of our reputable um, sites because they still don't have the information for us on how to respond. And so I am sorry I'm coming on this, and this is my, my soapbox, but we need, we, you need us. We're grassroots, yeah. but we need you to right. give us the information yeah. 
immediately and not allow us to to kind of look all over the place and all we find is Washington Post. Yeah, we're going to try. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we are going to, as I said, I apologize for how this last one uh, rolled out. It was from a leak and we couldn't hold on to the information when it had been leaked to the press. Uh, but we are going to do better in the future and try to make sure you are notified at least simultaneously. <laughs> that would be, um, and hopefully, you know, you're prepared uh, for the public announcement because we know you're on the front lines and people will call you immediately. And if you don't have any information that leaves you flat footed and doesn't make you look authoritative, which is we need to have you be an authoritative source. So we will, we're, we're sorry how this happened, how, how it, you know, uh, rolled out and we were, we're gonna try to do better on it. But sometimes we can't control leaks, which mm. is very unfortunate. I, I would just add Venus, I, I, I really appreciate your, we, we'll, we, we appreciate the comment because we'll take it back and, and uh, uh, I think make sure that people understand that I, I think sometimes uh, it's not fully understood how, uh, how, what, what the downstream consequences of these leaks can be. We sometimes just think it's, oh, the newspapers got it, but um, we appreciate this and, and we'll do our best here in the future. I, and, I, and I also see uh, someone else's comment about, yeah, it would be better if you knew before the press. And um, indeed, uh, to the extent that we can, uh, we, in the way things used to work in the olden days, we would have stakeholder calls um, before these press releases went out um, and we will do our best. I, I, I can't promise, and I, don't, I don't wanna make promises that I can't keep simply because in the COVID times, um, it's been very challenging. Uh, uh, they've been very challenging times, but I promise you we'll do our best. Thank you so much, Dr. Marks. We have a question from Rosha McCoy from AAMC. Rosha, would you like to ask your question line? Yes, um, thank you so much. Yes, in response to some of what Dr. Mark said about uh, patient providers, I'm wondering, I know you're the FDA and you're not CMS, but is there an opportunity for us to consider working with CMS to consider some sort of extra reimbursement for, for counseling about vaccines? You know, this is just getting more and more and more complex and the uh, population of folks that really need some extra time and counseling. And some of the vaccines are not even being given in physicians' offices. So taking the time to actually uh, provide the counseling may end up, they don't even get the administration fee. So right. just something to think about. I know you probably don't have a full answer, but something we may at the Association of American Medical Colleges may advocate for as well. I think that would be good. I believe the administration is very sensitive to this and they're talking about it. They have, I, I've been engaged in conversations about this. It, it clearly, the, they're currently reluctant, they're currently unvaccinated, as Peter said. They need uh, more of they need more time, they need more conversation. They're, they're things they need in order to get the shots in their arm. And we, it isn't just like the first the early adopters like me, for example, we rolled up our sleeves, we could hardly wait, you know, there were crowds. Um, but then now we're trying to talk, uh, talk to people who really have concerns. And so it's worthwhile uh, uh, really addressing those concerns. And I agree, it, it, people aren't gonna do that unless there's reimbursement available. So thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Woodcock. We have another question from Chelsea from G, uh, GBS CIDP. Chelsea, can you ask your question? Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm sorry to be back, but here we are. <laughs> um, there's kind of two points to this, and this comes directly from what we hear from the Guillain-Barre syndrome community. So number one, um, are you seeing signals in any of the other vaccines? My gut instinct is not yet or no. And then number two, if somebody does experience GBS symptoms after the first shot, and I know that typically applies to Pfizer and Moderna, but if we think about boosters that might be needed in the future for Janison. So if someone has experienced GBS symptoms, whether or not it was diagnosed, should they um, still get that second shot, whether it's part of their two dose series or whether it's a booster in the future? 
Um, I'll start. I'll start by saying that um, one of the reasons why we were concerned that there was a signal here is because we had experience with 208 at the time. It was now it's now 320, but at the time it was 285 million doses of the mRNA vaccines, and um, there was no the 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 rate of GBS looking at those vaccines was basically the baseline. It was it was basically a background rate. So. Um, that's a pretty large sample compared to uh, the 12.5 million. Uh, so we're pretty, sh we, we're feeling reasonably confident that there's not a signal there either after the first or second. And there's no first or second dose. There's just was nothing. It's just flat. Um, so um, again, nothing obvious there. Um, the, the answer of, of I, I don't have a good answer for you about if someone, uh, you know, I, I, I can tell you what I would suspect I would do. Um, which would be to probably use a different vaccine if possible, but that's just what I would do as a provider. I think it would have to be a neurologist would want to really think long and hard um, uh, 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 about those situations. And those are ones where there's a certain amount of, that, that, that's where it's the art of medicine and a good provider uh, patient relationship, mm -hmm. thinking about whether, you know, you give a second vaccination, whether you, uh, whether you, uh, try to understand antibody response in a in a uh, in a in a university type setting or something like this. So that's a challenging one. Uh, Dr. And Woodcock may want to answer that one because she's she's a, a bona fide immunologist. <laughs> well, my I would just simply add something which is quite different. Uh, I know the focus is on vaccines, but people who are have illnesses or felt they'd had serious side effects, keep in mind that we do have the monoclonal antibody treatments. They're very effective. And so if somebody does get sick because they haven't taken a vaccine, um, they really, and they're at high risk for pro, you know, progression, they're in a high risk group, uh, they really should consider getting a treatment that will prevent them from progressing with the disease. So obviously for the whole population, we need to vaccinate them, but there are gonna be people for one reason or another, maybe medically who had a bad reaction to their vaccine or whatever, don't want to uh, get further vaccinated. Um, there, we do have treatments that are effective. Thank you. That was Thank very helpful know. for our responses and our conversations with our Global Medical Advisory Board, um, which is actually represented on the call. I see Dr. Allen there, so thank you. Thank you so much, Chelsea, and thank you, Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Marks. We've reached the end of our call. I'd like to give Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Marks a chance to make any closing remarks. Well, I'll simply say uh, thank you again. Thank you for your work. Uh, hi, Jane Delgado. We didn't get to talk, but I can see you on the screen. Um, uh, thanks to you all. Uh, we will try to do better with in getting information to you in a timely manner so you're prepared when things break in the press. You can talk to your populations and your people, and uh, you are an authoritative source. Dr. Marks? So just thank you for your efforts to educate uh, patients and to help us uh, get people across the finish line to getting vaccinated. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, the FDA stakeholder engagement team is available. If you have any questions, if so, please feel free to email us at FDA stakeholder engagement at fda.hhs.gov. We hope to speak with you again soon. Thank you so much.